All right, welcome to Law & Crime Report, the Law & Crime Network. Uh, you know we're doing a gavel to gavel on all the top legal stories. So I got to go to one of the first ones. We got to throw it to a clip because Joe Exotic uh, and a team of supporters supporting him for a pardon. Guys, you know when I talk about this case, there's like three of them. Let's say it's a case that's going to keep on giving, and I think this is going to be one of them. Let's take a quick listen, and we'll be back on the other end with analysis. <laughs> I'm Eric Love, a former law enforcement officer turned businessman and private investigator. We built an army of attorneys to assist in the appeals process and right this monumental injustice. With this extensive support, this unit intends to prove that the Tiger King is not only not guilty, rather, he is the victim. Okay, he is the victim. Okay, let's just do a short recap for anyone who hasn't seen the Netflix special uh, which I did not and doesn't know about the case, but he was convicted of two counts of murder. He has, was charged with numerous wildlife crimes. He got a 22-year sentence. It was handled in federal court, and these advocates are exciting, uh, uh, or arguing that Exotic reportedly, uh, some of his people spent $10,000, I find this interesting, at a Trump property uh, in order to carry favor for this appeal. And supposedly Don Jr., uh, Trump Jr., is in support of this. And Donald Trump, the president of the United States in April, indicated that he would take a look at this request. Let me bring in my guest, Gigi Gonzalez out of Miami, Florida, criminal defense attorney. And as I always love to say, a second generation criminal, uh, criminal defense attorney. She was a per person who started working, I guess, for her salary and allowance from her father in the back room. So she knows it. it's in her DNA. Welcome to the show, Gigi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you guys. All right, great, great. And Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, we all know him. Uh, he is a distinguished scholar of applied forensics at Jacksonville State University. He holds a master in forensics degree in National University as a board certified fellow of American Board of Medical Legal Death Investigations. He began working in the Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office during his tenure. He was a senior investigator with the Medical Examiner's Office in Georgia. Uh, he helped establish all sorts of national training and is the author of Blood Beneath My Feet. We just recently got done doing a lecture before the New Jersey State Bar Association. Joseph, welcome. Hey, how you doing, Bob? <laughs> I'm living the dream, Joseph. So listen, here we go with Joe Exotic. I was saying to you guys off camera, I honestly think this is the gift that's going to keep on giving because there's a certain personality type that we see in the law that wants to continually have their fame and notoriety. I mean, why not? You're in jail. There's not much to do other than to go to a law library and try to find your way out of the situation you find yourself in. But there are a significant amount of supporters, however, who are trying to support this pardon application. And what the essential argument, uh, Gigi, is from what I understand, is that even though the Trumps knew about this, and even though the presidential pardon is solely within the discretion of the president of the United States pursuant to our constitution. There is an office, it's, a, it's an established office that all presidents have used at least for as long as I know called the Office of the Pardon Attorney. And they basically sent an email two days later denying this request for pardon. So GG, what is the argument? The argument is, is no, this was illegal, unconstitutional, because only the president of the United States himself, who has the sole and exclusive power to pardon, should have specifically been able to look at it. What are your thoughts? So first of all, there's no right uh, to, to be pardoned, right? Uh, when you are uh, sentenced and serving time, you don't have the right to say, hey, Mr. President, uh, check out my case and uh, definitely pardon me. You know, it is an exclusive power of the president to be able to to pardon or to uh, to commute uh, sentences. However, it's the president's power to also allocate an office, which this office was created, I believe, in the 1800s, in order to review applications and to send recommendations to the president. Now, I know President Trump has been giving out pardons like candy these last couple of months. But just because he's been giving them out doesn't mean that everybody gets one. And the fact that Joe Exotic Maldonado was denied his uh, request for pardon, it doesn't mean that Trump can override that, is going to override that, or that Joe Exotic has a case to be pardoned in the future. Joseph, to Gigi's point, I mean, in government, 
Uh, you were in government. You had a, a senior level position. The fact that, and I was prosecutor, I had the senior level position, doesn't mean that we can not delegate down. And the fact of the matter is Trump knows about this. There are probably, I would imagine, thousands and thousands, maybe even 10,000, maybe even more people that are seeking pardons. There's no way one individual man could do this. So let me ask you, Joseph Scott Morgan, is this just a ploy? A lawyer filed a six-page complaint here. Is this just a publicity stunt in order to get people to continue to support him? Or do you think that these lawyers and, and that Mr. Exotic really believes that his exotic request for a pardon by the a review by the president himself is really a legitimate claim? Uh, I don't know how it could be, but I, I got to add one one little aside here. That that clip that our our uh, fantastic group of producers ran just a second ago, uh, the production value was absolutely fantastic on that. Didn't you guys think that? It almost <laughs> looked like something that that uh, Netflix would have done. And so, uh, you know, oh. I look at the perspective uh, because. You know, it reeled me in early on because I couldn't get over the bizarre nature of it. Uh, and I watched it with my family and sat back and I thought, this is this is grotesque. It's gruesome. But much of the stuff that's on television is. But boy, uh, did it put a lot of butts in seats for uh, for Netflix. And I guarantee you, you know, if you talk about stirring the pot and keeping keeping the spotlight on things. I certainly think that uh, it's a nice little Christmas present for Netflix as well. Very, very interesting. I like the way it reeled you in, no pun intended, Joseph Scott Morgan. Okay, we got to switch gears because we've had enough of the Tiger King. And let's go to the uh, Rochester situation. As you guys know, uh, the police chief and the mayor uh, wound up in a dispute with one another with regard to the police-involved fatality of Daniel Prude. The chief is Laron Terry, and the mayor is Lovely Warren. Essentially, what's going on here is that the chief at a certain point in time said, I'm retiring, and the, he was then fired a couple of weeks before he could have gotten full medical benefits. And the chief is alleging one of those reasons is because he was being asked to lie and that he had informed the mayor of all the information surrounding the death and that it was a police-involved uh, homicide. It was declared a homicide eventually. The mayor saying, no, I was never advised that. And in support of that, I got a text message that indicates that um, he was, uh, she was only told that the death involved some sort of PCP uh, involved incident. So uh, there's a lot going on here. There's suits flying all over the place with respect to this GG. We've got a civil suit from the family with regard to the uh, police death, custody death, a civil rights violation. We have now the chief suing the town and the mayor saying that he was defamed um, and he was, he was basically being made to be a scapegoat and essentially saying that he was subpoenaed to testify before the town council. The mayor didn't want anything to do with it. And the mayor, by the way, if I understand this correctly, had been charged with a campaign finance violation of some fraud allegations with regard to her campaign, which which he's pled not guilty. There is a lot of litigation that is going on in this case. Give me your analysis as to what you think is going to happen with all this. Oh, yeah, this is a very tangled web, especially when we consider, you know, the life of, of uh, Daniel Prude. You know, this is someone who was experiencing a mental health issue and his family called in in order to get help not to report a crime. And so for Daniel Prude to then be suffocated to death stemming from this mental health incident, A, raises a lot of concerns as to how the police officers in Rochester's are being trained, if they're not doing enough mental health training and uh, de-escalation training there. And not only that, you've got all of these civil suits. I think the family is certainly fitting uh, for a victory in their suit. And uh, the officer in this case makes a very compelling argument that he was a scapegoat. And if it's true that the mayor did ask him to lie and to cover up facts and to and to paint a different picture of what happened that day, then that mayor is going to be in very hot water also. And that behavior is pattern of fraud. So it's definitely not going to help that case either. 
Yeah, and Joseph, part of this allegation is that, you know, when the mayor was advised, what the mayor was advised to, my experience in law enforcement is that police chiefs work very closely with the mayor. The mayor is instrumental to their job survival, as we see in this particular case. So they're pretty much uh, put up to date with regard to all this. But I'm going to push back just a little bit on what Gigi said here, and, and feel free to comment. And, and with great respect, I understand completely what she's saying. That's an argument. I want to pre uh, pre present another one. Police officers are trained a certain way, and there could be training issues, that's for sure. But they go to a, a call with a mentally disturbed person who may be under the influence of a, a psych psychotropic or psychotic medication. The person is acting erratically, is out there naked. They put a spit mask over his face, which is protocol to do. Bring him down right. to the ground for the two minutes. Um, so, I mean, there's, I, I often say, I, I, if we're going to say the police did something wrong, if we're going to say that, you have to understand, folks out there, I know cops. I ran 44 police agencies for a long time. They tried to follow the training. I'm not saying there's not bad cops out there, but this was one of those situations that's happening instantaneously, and they have to take action. And we just don't, Joseph Scott Morgan, have the resources to continue to put medical teams out there, which is the optimal situation to handle a case like this. But unfortunately, I'll give you the old mantra I, get, I kept being told when I was prosecutor, and it goes on and on. You have to do more with less, and especially when it comes down to mental health. Yeah, you do. And you had mentioned the nature of the medication. Let's just throw it out there. It's PCP. And if folks are not aware of this, PCP is actually an equine tranquilizer that was used for years and years. And of course, it became very popular on the street back in the early 70s and continued on through the 80s. But that's not really what I want to talk about. Uh, the idea that this guy, succumb to what's referred to as excited delirium syndrome, which is kind of a, um, a break where the, the mental or, or mental incapacitation merges with the physical response and you get an in individual that will throw an irregular heart rhythm and die. But I am sick and tired to my back teeth of these politicians, these mayors, whether yeah. it be Rochester or Chicago, or Portland or wherever else where they're throwing these cops under the bus. You know, she was not out there restraining uh, the, this gentleman out in the middle of the street. This, this chief who's got a long outstanding career and by all accounts is a fine person, a fine manager of cops, he was doing what he was supposed to have done. And she's gonna get to keep her job. This is what, this at the end of the day, this is what I hope. I hope no one settles. I, I agree yeah. with Gigi and Pence. I want to see this go to trial. I want to see this in open court. I want to hear exactly what occurred in that room. I, I have two things I'd like to say before we go to a quick break. Number one, I like people to ask the rhetorical question like we would in law school. If those cops didn't do what they did and he committed harm to himself or others, then they'd be in hot water for that. Again, we'll wait to see what the facts develop and what they are. And number two, Joseph Scott Morgan, I cannot agree more. I did not allow it as prosecutor. No police chief or mayor from any town was given press conferences in cases that the prosecutor was handling for these very reasons. You guys are awesome. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Kyle Rittenhouse back in the news. All right, Kyle Rittenhouse, again, another case we keep discussing out of Kenosha, Wisconsin. You know this was uh, the person who was charged with having killed uh, two individuals. He's also got an attempted murder charge out there in Kenosha. He had brought the AR-15 rifle. Um, the defense is arguing that this is self-defense and that he was there to protect businesses. Well, now there's a free Kyle merchandise um, website that's out there. And this free Kyle uh, website has all sorts of things you can buy. T-shirts and hats and, and buttons and stickers and iPad covers and iPhone covers, uh, coffee mugs, all sorts of things in order to raise money. Now, it is suggested by this website that the money that's being ra raised is being held in trust by his mother to just go towards his legal defense. You will remember that some of the fundraising efforts here uh, led to the fact that he was able to be released on a $2 million bail. So um, let's throw to a clip of the detective that is describing the attack of this incident that started all this at the preliminary hearing. You described three individuals who approached the defendant. Uh, the first one you indicated um, had um, attempted to kick the defendant. Is that correct? Correct. Was that individual ever identified? As of now, no. 
Now, you indicated that the defendant fired two shots in the air uh, at about the same time as that first individual approached him. Can you describe the location of those shots uh, vis-a-vis the location of that individual? They were in close proximity to kind of his uh, chin area uh, as he's going over. Uh, Kyle, those two rounds pass, I'm assuming, relatively close uh, to his, the front of his face, missing just barely. How are you able to uh, uh, know this information? Were you personally there? Uh, no, I've reviewed uh, multiple videos of this incident. Is it fair to say that uh, much of what you've described here was captured on video by numerous sources that evening? Correct. And with regard to that first individual, uh, did the defendant shoot at that individual? You're referring to the one who attempted to kick him? Yes. Uh, yeah, at the individual, absolutely. Was that individual struck? I don't believe so. We've, we've never identified him. And you said there was a second individual subsequently identified as Anthony Huber who approached the defendant. Uh, was that captured on video? Correct. And what does that video show that Mr. Huber did with regard to the defendant? Uh, at that point, the defendant's on the ground. Uh, Mr. Huber approaches him uh, with a skateboard in his arm or in his hand. Uh, he's sort of directing it kind of towards his shoulder neck area. And it appears he's trying to reach for the, the rifle that the defendant is possessing at that time. Um, I, I, it's hard to tell if there's actual contact, but then a, a shot is fired. And when you say a shot is fired, who fired that shot? The defendant. And did that shot uh, strike and kill Mr. Huber? Yes, it did. Gigi, based on what you're hearing here, and you see what's going on. They're, they're basically saying that this was not a self-defense situation, that there should not have been lethality of force used in the, in the case. How powerful do you think that testimony is with regard to the video capturing of some of these, instance, these instances that would go against the defense's self-defense claim? You know, I think what is most powerful for the defendant is the fact that there's video evidence of the victims in the case approaching Kyle Rittenhouse while he's on the ground, right? He doesn't quite have access to his rifle, from what I understood, and people are coming at him with skateboards or trying to kick him. So the defense is doing a good job at using the evidence available to them to contextualize what is actually going on uh, in the mind of Kyle Rittenhouse. He's on his back, on the ground, there are uh, people trying to attack him with their bodies, with their skateboards, and he had to defend himself to get away from the situation. So I think the defense is doing the very best they can with the information and the evidence uh, in the case. Right, and keeping in mind, folks, that we say this all the time here at the Law Crime Network, it's self-defense is not a term that we just throw around uh, in a in layman's way as a very specific meaning in each state and to what level you can escalate that force. And I'm sure prosecutors are gonna say, even that being true, what's being said, in no way justifies lethal force. That will be the prosecution's argument. Um, Joseph, let me ask you, this website, uh, freekyleusa.com, in it, they, they make some statements in there, is that the defendant volunteered to help protect local businesses and was forced to defend his life and the God-given constitutional right to self-defense is now on trial in Kenosha. Um, so this has really been a lightning rod in this country, pitting Black Lives supporter matter, uh, matters uh, supporters who are arguing that this is white vigilante looking to pro provoke violence versus the gun rights advocates who are saying that there's a right to be able to possess weapons and to protect property and people. Where, where do you see this uh, headed to? I mean, it, it's definitely going to be a trial in the case, but this is the kind of case I think could incendiarily, one way or the other, create problems, whatever the result of that trial will be. Yeah, and for me, you know, I'm, I'm always going to look at the science and, and what I see displayed before me, and uh, the video evidence is quite compelling in this particular case. Uh, you've got a guy that is down on his back at this point in time, and yes, he's a 17-year-old in possession um, of an, an AR, uh, an AR weapon. And you know, I think you know when you look at this thing, I, there's no way, Bob, as you well know, there's no way to predict how anyone is going to necessarily feel about this case. But feelings have nothing to do with it. At the end of the day, the idea here is uh, what exactly happened 
uh, transactionally, you know, with this group. Um, yeah, there is there is a duty on a citizen to to you know retreat to a certain degree, but how far can this kid retreat if he's laying on his back? You know, he's going to have to crab walk backwards and still get away from these people that are kicking at him, and they have a skateboard and all these other things that Gigi had had mentioned just a second ago. So in trial, that's going to be very very powerful. It, it really is, and. You know, the gunshot wounds that these people uh, sustained are ghastly. You can see them online. Uh, but that's, you know, that's the world that we live in. That's the reality of this. So, uh, you know, I can't speak to how people are going to feel about it, but uh, we do have some uh, we do have some interesting geography to accompany uh, this commentary. All right, let's listen to some of the cross-examination of the defense attorney of that detective. Mr. Zabinski fired his gun while Mr. Rosenbaum was chasing my client, correct? Objection, relevance. Mr. Richards? It's, it's relevant. It goes to the events in question of how it was Mr. Rosenbaum became shot. Your Honor, we're, we're getting into uh, what I know the defense wants to do today, which is make this a self-defense case. And as the court has already indicated, that's an issue for trial. Uh, what happened before this incident, what happened with regard to Mr. Zeminski is beyond the scope of this prelim. It does not go to the probable cause as to whether or not the defendant committed a felony. And I object to the relevance of this. It does. Well, relevance is a low burden. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll, 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 I'll overrule on this question. But again, I'm going to keep a tight rein on it, Mr. Richards, as you understand. Understood. Mr. Rosenbaum is not wearing a shirt in Exhibit 3, correct? Not wearing it traditionally. He's wearing it around his face, correct? Correct. Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 4. The bearded individual in the upper right-hand corner, do you recognize him? Objection. I do. Relevance. All right, what's the relevance of this now, Mr. Mr. Richard? Zeminski holding a firearm, the individual who shot first at Kyle. You can see the well, firearm that, that... clearly. Okay, but that's at this juncture, your second part of your statement or your comment uh, shot first uh, is uh, outside the scope of this examination. I'm going to, for that purpose, I'm going to sustain that objection. Gigi, can you explain for us a little bit about what this preliminary hearing is, what the parameters are, and what these objections uh, to relevance are that the prosecutor is making here? Sure. So at this hearing, they're determining whether or not Kyle Rittenhouse committed a felony. Now, self-defense, that's an affirmative defense, right? Meaning you committed this felony, but you had to do it in order to save yourself, right? That's essentially what the defense is arguing, is that Kyle Rittenhouse had to use his AK-40, uh, which, excuse me, the AR-15, in order to execute these people because his life was in danger. Now, at this hearing, they're only determining whether Kyle Rittenhouse committed the felony, which is using that AR-15 to terminate the life of another person. And they're uh, objecting to relevancy because the defense is trying to uh, paint the picture that, you know, there are other aggressors that pointed a gun at Kyle Rittenhouse that caused him to shoot, or that Kyle Rittenhouse was always being um, antagonized, or he was the victim in this case, when that is not the scope of this hearing. They're merely determining whether he committed a felony. And so the defense has to tailor their questions into whether or not he did or he didn't. And that's the trouble because we saw on video that he did. Yeah, Joseph, um, you've been an expert that have been on the witness stand. On the other end of this, are lawyers asking uh, questions. Um, are, I'm just curious, when you're up there and you're listening to these objections, are, are you guys really following or caring what they are? Or are you just there basically saying, look, when I'm told to answer a question, I'll answer a question. And then the second part of my question is, there are some judges that are basically basically say, I'm going to let the defense do what it wants because it's a Sixth Amendment issue. I want to give them wide latitude where prosecutors argue this is just merely a fishing expedition. I'm sure you've listened to all of this in your career. What do you think? Yeah, I, I try to stay, uh, stick with the facts and the words of the bard. I always say brevity is the soul of wit. I was taught a long time ago, keep your mouth shut other than the facts that you're that you are. Uh, essentially uh, qualified to speak to. And, I, you know, uh, they're talking legalese. Uh, and for me as an expert, when I'm on the stand, uh, I address the facts as they are presented to me as dispassionately as possible. And, and yeah, I mean, as a person, it can get kind of annoying. I, I've been 
I've been in the middle of fights between uh, both tables, you know, that I, I was left sitting, you know, sitting there uh, for 30 minutes at a time uh, without a break and just listening to these two go back and forth. And it's hard sometimes. It's very difficult for that not to influence you. And you don't want to just wander off into the weeds mentally. You have to stay sharp. So it's uh, it's difficult. Now, uh, as to uh, the point at hand, uh, I think I think many times, and this might not be within the scope of this hearing, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of this is going to have to do uh, with what Rittenhouse's perception was at that particular time. And to another interesting point, Bob, uh, and I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. This kid's 17 years old. Uh, there, there are a lot of sto- uh, studies out there that talk about developmental issues, you know, relative to, uh, you know, our, our frontal cortex is not completely developed until, you know, we hit 21. So I'm interested to see if defense is going to bring in, uh, you know, uh, a developmental psychiatrist, this sort of thing, in order to, to talk about this when this finally goes to trial. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether that is quote unquote relevant. I don't know specifically in Wisconsin, but most states require that it's not how they perceived it while that's important, but the standard is whether it was objectively reasonable, um, the the self-defense use of force. But that may very well go to it. And that's a great question, uh, Joseph. And I think the defense attorneys will definitely go there. Whether it will be admitted as evidence, that we'll have to wait to see. Folks, we'll be back with some more great stories. Stick with us. We'll be back on the other end of the break. On the morning of Monday, December 14th, the Fresno County Sheriff's Office and the Fresno Police Department and Lieutenant Ron Hughes is joining me here today, received a report of a missing 12-year-old Fresno girl. During the early portion of the investigation, detectives developed information that the girl may have been coerced into running away with an older man. A man she had met through social media in mid-October. The information pointed to the girl possibly heading to Fresno Yosemite International Airport to catch a cross-country flight to Virginia to be with this man. Due to the nature of the circumstances of this case, detectives with the Central California Internet Crimes Against Children, or ICAC, task force took over the investigation. Uh, Lieutenant Brandon Purcell, uh, who commands that, unit is here. Detectives received assistance from members of the Fresno Airport Police and Homeland Security Investigations, who revealed a man later identified to be Nathan Larson was seen with a young girl, and the two boarded a plane bound for Washington, D.C. Once in custody, detectives learned more about how the abduction took place. Larson flew to Fresno from Virginia and then traveled to the girl's home, He persuaded her to sneak out of her house at around two in the morning. He used a rideshare company to pick her up and together they rode to the Fresno airport. Larson made her wear a long hair wig to alter her appearance and make her look older. He also told her to act as though she was disabled and unable to speak to ensure she would not converse with anyone at the airport while making their way onto the airplane. All right, welcome back. You know, a horrific case, Gigi. I I couldn't help when I was reading the facts of this case that we have multiple jurisdictions where this has occurred. It involves the airlines. There was an assault of a Homeland Security person during the execution of a search warrant at his home. These crimes constitute also enticement as far as illegal interstate travel and transportation of a minor and child pornography. My bet I'm going to give it a 99.999% that the federal government is going to institute charges uh, for those very things. And I can tell you that some of those offenses carry up to life in prison. Oh, yeah, that's a really good bet, Bob, a really good bet. And uh, from the looks of it, I mean, don't get me wrong, everyone is innocent until proven guilty. With that said, the paper trail against Mr. Larson in this case is going to be huge. Absolutely everything he did uh, in this case, from uh, uh, enticing a minor through social media to using a rideshare app to pick her up and drop her off at the airport to purchasing plane tickets. I mean, this guy is cooked. 
<laughs> uh, that's that is the legal definition of cookedness. Yes, definitely, <laughs> Joseph. <laughs> you know, I, I I I don't disagree. I mean, these are the crimes that prosecutors live for. Uh, the ICAC units and and Nick Mick and all the national and state local officials. This is a 12 year old child. Okay, so the, you can't get that refrain that oh, it was just a statutory thing and what have you. Um, the depth of what went on here with regard to this investigation was not surprisingly pretty amazing. I, I think that he is going to go down for a very long time for other reasons we'll discuss in a moment, but just on this case alone. But can you talk to us a little bit about the forensic aspect of this investigation and how, how the cops are piecing this together as to where she's going, where he's going? How do they connect them? Well, I think a lot of this is going to come down to electronic surveillance. Um, and when you begin uh, with a lot of these predators like this, when you do a deep dive into their data, it, it's not just the images that she may have sent him. This is not, he didn't just start this out, Bob, okay? Um, one of the things they're going to be looking at here is what what are his interconnections with other people with these proclivities? You know, because there's a lot of sharing that goes on of these files. Um, there are probably be video in addition to uh, also uh, the photography. Now, when it comes down to any kind of assault uh, that may have taken place, that's going to be significant because there'll be DNA linkage. Um, there might even be uh, 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 photographic images, and I've, I've actually been involved in cases like this, where you have perpetrators photographing themselves as they are physically assaulting the victim. Yeah. It's very gruesome stuff. Yeah, J Joseph, I actually find that that is more likely than not, because uh, they love to have those trophy pictures. Anyway, um, let's switch real quick to a clip of the sheriff that's talking about some unusual aspects of Larson's background, and, and it, it is odd. During the investigation, detectives uncovered Nathan Larson has a deeply disturbing background. He is a white supremacist and a well-known advocate for pedophilia. This is a man who runs a website which encourages the raping of children and sharing of naked photos and video of children being raped. We are not identifying his website at this time, but he used multiple social media platforms to communicate with our victim from Fresno. During the past two months, Larson was able to convince the Fresno girl through manipulation and grooming to send him pornographic images of herself. In 2017, Larson ran for political office as an independent seeking to become a member of the Virginia House of Delegates representing District 31. He went on to lose that race. Part of his platform was to change the laws to allow for incestual relationships and sex with minors. In December 2008, while living in Boulder, Colorado, Larson sent a detailed email to the U.S. Secret Service threatening to kill the President of the United States. At the time, George Bush was the outgoing president and Barack Obama was the incoming president. Larson pled guilty in federal court. In October of 2009, he was sentenced to 16 months in a federal prison and wound up serving 14 months. I mean, this is just incredible. Uh, guys, just to add a couple of other things here, uh, he did a, a, an interview with the Huffington Post when he was running for office and asked if he just wrote about pedophilia or actually participated or was one. And he said, quote, it's a mix of both. You can be assured that statement will be used against him in this particular case. He glorifies um, Adolf Hitler as well. And as the U.S. attorney indicated, he pled guilty. Gigi, I'm looking at about how prosecutors look at things. Let's go to that little child pornography piece alone, alone. And if, if, it's, if he's charged federally, is carrying 15-year minimum, 15-year minimum. And when you put the relevant conduct in here, what the law enforcement agency said, and it's clear, the sophistication of the plan, you go here, I go there, I meet up with you, you get on a plane, everything that was going on there, had, had her put a, a wig on and act as if she was a disabled person who couldn't talk. This is the kind of stuff when a judge reads a probation report, if he either pleads guilty or if he's found guilty, that it's lights out. I mean, it's it's pretty disturbing. 
It's very disturbing. And uh, when I look at this through my criminal defense eyes, I'm thinking, plea, deal, cooperate, show immense rem remorse and responsibility because there is just absolutely ain't nothing redeemable about this particular defendant. He's got a violent criminal history and a history of advocating for pedophilia, which is uh, a case in a very important part of the charges that, he, uh, that are being brought against him now. Uh, so we've got a confession, we've got pattern, we've got a way of thinking that has been clearly illustrated over the years, mm. and he's not likable. This is a white supremacist who tried to take a hit out on Obama. I mean, this guy is just cooked. His best bet is to find a criminal defense attorney with a lot of pizzazz and charisma that will get the judge to see things their way and hopefully <clears throat> plea for a better sentence than what he's going to be facing if he goes to trial. I hate to say this, you know, we a lot of us here have a lot of pizzazz and charisma, but I don't think all of our charisma and pizzazz put together is going to help. Listen, guys, if anybody has no. information, because this probably isn't a first time event, and I'm just saying it may not be, you can call the Fresno Sheriff at 559 600 8144. Joseph Scott Morgan, I'm sorry, let me give you one more, or Nick Mick, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at HTTPS colon backslash backslash reportcybertip.org. It is so important. Joseph, what are the messages, the takeaways that we should as law enforcement people be telling parents about what to do in order to protect their children from these kind of predators who are lurking on the internet and on all these social media apps? Well, unlike when you and I were kids, Bob, <laughs> uh, by virtue of the fact that we have and are surrounded by all of these devices, uh, they enter our home and it, it makes it, it's overwhelming, I think, uh, for many people. So uh, from an electronic standpoint, uh, they need to remain ever vigilant. And I can say that until I'm blue in the face, but uh, it's the onus is on the parents to do that and to teach the kids from right from wrong uh, relative to this. Unfortunately, they have other influences in their life uh, through uh, media and through electronics that are influencing them as well. It's very difficult for parents. So you have to be very, very careful because these predators are out there. They're, they're lurking everywhere. They're roving uh, you know, over the surface of the earth, looking who they're going to destroy. And uh, these people will stop at nothing, just like this guy. I really hope the cops are very careful with the evidence that they're collecting in, on this guy because there's a lot of it. I just hope that they stay within the boundaries and that they piece this thing together so that it creates this fantastic mosaic so that the court can fully appreciate how heinous this is. You know, when we used to tell uh, people when we would give our lectures as prosecutors to parents about monitoring the social media apps, putting in security devices, we were accused of being big brother and parents were some of them, some of them, not all of them, were concerned about their kids' privacy interests, so on and so forth. There are none. They're your children. They're your ward. They are not of age. There is a responsibility to make sure something like this doesn't happen. Um, I, I just like to say, I, I hope that most out there get that it is so easy for bad people to infiltrate through these social media apps. Guys, Galene Maxwell, we talked about her last week. She's got a bail motion. She put together a prolific and beautiful package to convince the judge. And I was convinced that the package was good, but there's been a development. We'll talk to you about that on the other end of the break. All right, Galene Maxwell is back in the news. Last week, we had covered the story where they put a bail package together to say, we have all of these assets, all of these resources that we're putting into this package, tens of millions of dollars in order that she is to say that she is not a flight risk. Now, keep in mind here, she is a resident of France and she's living in the United States right now. Prosecutors are objecting to that, and they're saying that that's not good enough to secure her appearance. Now, I think I was even on with Gigi last week when we looked at it. We said, listen, bail is there to make sure you secure the appearance of an individual. And with electronic monitoring and with all the conditions, that would seem sufficient enough to be able to put her on house arrest with that electronic monitoring. However, one of the pillars of her bail motion was that she is 
married. Now, we didn't know that. The secret husband, she's married to this person, and that person is chipping in money, too. And the, the essential argument is that she wouldn't leave her friends and leave her husband, who's put all this money in, so she's not a flight risk. Well, what do we find out this week? Prosecutors responded from the United States Attorney's Office in a 36-page brief in opposition to release. I can tell you that is a very extensive brief in opposition. The prosecutor stated that the defendant asked to live with another person after they were released, not the secret husband. Um, the prosecutor said that the husband did not come forward right after the arrest, but only now, and that that was suspicious. And, quote, all of this says and undermines her assertion that her marriage is a tie that would keep her in the United States. They also, the prosecutors, unearthed bank records that showed only recently that the defendant, that is Maxwell, and this mystery husband listed their marital status in a trust document as single, not married. So that's pretty amazing. And the defendant and spouse have essentially put together 22 million five hundred thousand dollars sometimes it takes me a lot to be able to put those numbers around my head and that some of the information that maxwell gave to pretrial services which is the department that is responsible for producing a report to the judge about the amenability to bail that she had failed to tell those individuals that she's in the process of divorcing that husband Gigi, i'm going to go to you um, you've been around the block ever since you were interning with your dad for your allowance and all the way to today. The one thing you tell a client when they go in for pretrial services or for that matter, anytime they're giving a statement is you need to be 100% accurate because any level of deception will go against you. And I should add, and you educated me off break, France does not have an extradition treaty with citizens that are charged in the United States. So if she gets herself to France, she can't be brought back. Exactly right, exactly right. And that's her, that's her risk of flight. That's the government's strongest uh, point to demonstrate that she's going to be a risk of flight. Because, you know, like we discussed last week, they did put forward a pretty, a really good new package, right? In their new motion for reconsideration of the conditions of her bond for the judge to consider. Right, they're bringing forward millions of dollars in assets between her friends and her family, uh, betting that she is going to show up to court. And if she doesn't show up, that means all of their assets, their uh, properties, their collaterals is out the window. That's a major bet to make on someone. And not only that, you know, I if I were her criminal defense lawyer, I'd be trying to spin that. Yeah, maybe she, she did tell the truth at the pre-trial services. She was getting a divorce because this was an incredibly stressful situation. But now the husband, they've reconciled and he's going to stand next to her and say that he's going to ensure her presence in trial because he believes in her innocence and he's going to put up his assets too to bet on it. So maybe this isn't uh, her lying to pre-trial services. This is a new fact for the judge to take into consideration in her new motion for bail. All right, Gigi's argument, I think I can sum up, Joseph, is love has sprung anew um, here in, in this marriage, and he's willing to put up the dollars and that the judge should take that into consideration and if there's other ways of monitoring her. Um, you know, that's a fair argument, a good one, a, a, a much better argument that we can make you know, for her here than in so many of the other cases we covered today because there's such different, like that, uh, that, that uh, Congress person that was sitting there uh, trying to uh, have sexual relations with a 12 year old. Joseph, what do you think about that? Well, first, I want to go on the record and say I want Gigi as my defense attorney in the event yeah. <laughs> run into trouble. I like that passion. Uh, yeah, I, I got to tell you, you know, what, <laughs> uh, what insurance do I have? Uh, if I'm the investigator in this case, uh, you know, I can only imagine, and I, I'm looking at this from the investigator's perspective right now, and, and trust me, there are hundreds of investigators, not just in the U.S., but also in, in Europe as well, people involved with Interpol, they're involved in this investigation. And everything this judge, everything this court does, they're hanging on every syllable, every phrase, Everything is in the balance with this case because she is the key that unlocks everything. And they're terrified right now uh, that uh, that she might fly the coop. I, I, I would, I, I don't know. I, I cannot even begin to imagine this case. They've spent so long building this case. It, they really have to uh, have to think about this before they they uh, they allow her to uh, to walk the streets. Gigi, real quick, we have a short period of time left. 
But, you know, I, I, I like your argument. And couldn't your argument also be just because they have money, it doesn't mean they should be denied bail, that the investigators were able to look at all their assets, and the mere fact you have money doesn't mean that necessarily means you can escape? I never got that connection between money and escaping. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I, and I don't think that's their strongest case, the governments. You know, the fact that you have money to afford lawyers to afford to go off and live in the south of France without a uh, worry of extradition, you know, that's not really fair, especially when they put forward a package right, that Gigi. is betting that she's going to be in court. All right, Gigi, I'm sorry I got to cut you off there. But that's the end of the program. Love having these guests on. I hope you guys have a great week. Stay tuned for our regularly scheduled program, and I'll be back next week. Thank you.